championships going on within this event. That would have been insane. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, he's going to be coming up against Christopher Shemansky, who uh, has some impressive um, accomplishments under his belt. He's been more of a bridesmaid rather than a bride as of late. He's of course, come second place uh, with the Metagross GX variant, as well as um, also playing Groudon Wobbuffet to a second place finish in some recent regionals. Yeah, and uh, from Magnus's side, it, again, a bit of a different sort of thing. Maybe not so second uh, so much, but he has top eighted, top forward, and top eighted uh, Norway Norwegian nationals in 2014, 15, and 16, respectively. And he also got top 16 at the 2016 Liverpool regionals. Yeah, so he has been up and down all over the place, not only on his home turf, now coming back to the UK and also getting some impressive performances. We do want to hear from you guys, though. There's plenty to talk about for this game, but also we have another one of our polls that you can be getting involved with using the hashtag uh, on the Twitter, Pokemon News UK. You can get over to us, and we are going to be asking you the question, what is your favourite supporter from the Sun and Moon expansions. You have four options to choose from here. Vote for your favourite. We have the well-known Guzma. We have Professor Kakui, of course, the professor from the Sun and Moon sets. And also we have two new introductions from the Crimson Invasion expansions. We have both Gladion and Lusamine, who we've seen a couple of throughout the uh, tournaments this weekend. Yeah, it's going to be very interesting to see what wins that. I mean, an obvious favourite has to be Guzma out of all the competitive ones here. It is the one we see the most often in competitive decks. But you never know, Kakui might sneak in there and there might be some you know, favouritism for you know people who you know perhaps played play, play the video game really mm -hmm. you know, so like uh, you know, Gladion and Lusamine from that. It, you never know, there could be a surprise winner. And as much as Guzma is loved as a card, it's also hated at the same time. <laughs> That's a very true indeed. You can not only win by it, but you could also lose to it, and sometimes you miss the Guzma and you're just cursing yourself saying, <laughs> if only I could have got this card. So yeah. it'll be a real interesting dis debate to see yeah. which one comes out on top there. In fact, I'm thinking about it, maybe if you think about the two people in the last match, I think uh, <laughs> one will be going to vote for Guzma, one will be voting for anything but Guzma in that poll. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So we'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Once again, uh, get in touch with us on Twitter. And uh, we have all the other social media as well. But for Twitter itself, Pokemon News UK is where you can get involved in that poll. Yeah, absolutely. So in the, mean in the meantime, though, whilst you guys are voting for that poll, let's talk a little bit about the matchup here. So it's a very interesting matchup. We have uh, Magnus will be playing this... Uh, Zorok Golisopod deck and uh, Christopher Shemansky is going to be playing of course as you've already seen Gardevoir GX so two I guess broken decks you could call them or yeah. two very very strong archetypes that have uh, really proven themselves in to make them all the way to the top eights and who do you think actually has the edge here because I I'm finding it really tough to call uh, I'm yeah, again, I think both of these archetypes, really the story of the London International Championships has been based around these two archetypes. Going into the event, everyone was saying Gardevoir is probably the best deck. We all think this is going to be the one that is going to do the best. Only one of them making the top eight. But also the story that has been emerging throughout uh, this weekend so far has been the appearance of this Zoroark Golisopod GX variant where we've seen very prominent players, uh, most notably Tord Reklev and Magnus, who have both made it into the top eight with it now that uses puzzles of time, acer rollers and lots of other tricks up its sleeve as well. And it, it's emerging itself to be contending as one of the new best decks in format. So you can almost call this a final before the final in terms of which deck will reign supreme here. Yeah, I could not agree more. In any case, we are off, ladies and gentlemen. This is our second topic feature match. It's Magnus against Christopher, Norway against the US. Magnus will be going first, starting with a Wimpod. He does have a Wimpod. Looking at the prize cam straight away, we see that there's two Zerua in the prize cards. This could be a little bit awkward for him. Magnus does, of course, have to be a little bit careful about how many Zoroark he wants to get into play, as we do know that Chris Christopher is opting to use a build of Gardevoir that actually has two Gallades in it and that is all, always something to be afraid of if you are Magnus giving up or sort of offering up two prizes that Christopher could take with a non-GX Pokemon so it may look a little bit awkward that those are his prizes but at the same time it could also help him out in terms of his own game plan. Yeah the one thing he can do is of course he can counterbalance that with the use of his Glycopods of course. Mm -hmm. This is the the whole way the deck really works is that you have these it, it's almost it's, it's basically stage ones. Yeah. You've you got these two really strong stage one Pokemon. One gives you your draw engine and a great attack. The other one gives you an even a really great attack that can actually be powered up for even easier. And with this, you can just do this very consistent sort of two-shot damage, which eventually your opponent will be too overwhelmed to deal with. Yeah, and it's just great type coverage. We've seen that Golisopod's so effective at dealing with uh, Greninja variants and also just simply not having fighting weakness is just good enough for you because both of the cards do similar amounts of damage and gets the job done. So 
both players here opening with Bridget. Uh, really good starts from both sides here. Yeah, definitely. It'll be interesting to see what Christopher grabs off of this Bridget. I imagine it'll probably be two ults and a Remoraid. We do see that there are, it are none of those in his prizes. Just a couple of Ultra Ball and a Tapu Lele um, and then turn some energies and an N. So he will be able to get this ideal setup going here. Now, I can't. he does seem to have an energy in his hand as well. So, yeah, actually, about as ideal a setup as Christopher could ask for. Yeah, he could be going for Remoraid. He could be going for multiple Rolts. That's actually what he's eyeing up right now. He also has the option for the Alolan Vulpix. Christopher's build is, as we say, um, there we are, the Alolan Vulpix. So choosing not to play the Sylveon variant, he is instead opting to fill his deck with four copies of Max Potion, and that's definitely going to be a factor throughout this series. Yeah, definitely. So there goes the Alolan Vulpix, of course. The immensely powerful attack beacon costs no energy. This, of course, is only Alolan Pokemon currently that feature these no energy attacks. That's sort of their trademark thing. Allows you to just search your deck for any two Pokemon, reveal them to your opponent, and put them in your hand. And it looks like he's eyeing up a Tapu Lele as well as a Rolt. So continuing on the basic Pokemon train here, allowing him to get a Tapu Lele means he can guarantee a supporter for the following turn and more rolls on the board especially because Magnus's deck aims to be as aggressive as possible it normally tries to stifle the setup of these stage 2 decks so I really like that Christopher rather than looking for things like rare candy options or more curliers he's saying I need multiple rolls out here yeah not only that as well but because Christopher as we mentioned is playing 2 Gallade and 3 Gardevoir he wants to maybe most Gardevoir decks are content with only putting down 2 or 3 rolls. not Christopher Christopher wants to make sure he gets out the maximum number of rolls possible and especially considering he wanted to to have the Tapu Lele option to, to support the next turn, it makes absolutely complete sense to, to take this line of play. So we see the first trade from Magnus. He's going to attach a double colorless energy to his Zoroark GX. No Guzmaring there, so he's just going to be content with the knockout. First prize of the game, and uh, he's going to deal with that Alolan Vulpix, and it goes back over to Christopher, who it looks like he has a very strong hand going into this turn. Yeah, he does. He's got Ultra Ball. He's got double colors. There's a Curly there ready to go. He draws this to another Curlier as well. So he's going to be able to set up very nicely here. And that other Rolt tip, which you just searched off the beacon, will go onto the bench to boot. Lots of double colors energy. He doesn't have rare candy in his hand. So instead of uh, going for maybe, looks like he's going to go for a Guzma play, trying to maybe stall one of these Wimpods potentially and protect some of his Curliers on the bench. Yeah, the one unfortunate thing for Christopher was that his Alone of Volpix was cared so soon. Of course, he did go for the Rolts and the uh, and the Tapu Lele off of the uh, off of the beacon, and but it means he can't do a follow up beacon to then search his next evolution. So yeah, instead he's going to be content with doing the Guzma and going to bring that Wimpod into the active and uh, do do 40 damage to it. Dealing the 40 damage doesn't open up uh, Acerola as an out to move this Pokemon uh, for Magnus, but I think Christopher really, the only thing he's concerned about is Guzma at this point. He doesn't mind an Acerola, that's something that he'd almost welcome. Uh, even if it does mean that the Tapu Lele is suffering some damage, it would bring the Zoroark back into the active position and he has a Gallade and another double colorless in his hand. So he would welcome an Acerola, so there's no reason to not do the energy drive there for 40 damage. Yeah, it's like you were saying earlier, one of the main focuses of this, uh, this deck that Magnus is playing is to disrupt setups and if Magnus were able to find a Guzma, he could then KO another Curlier and uh, really leave Christopher with not many options to evolve into later on. So as we see here, Magnus getting into a second Zoroark GX here, and uh, he has plenty of options. He's eyeing up an Ultra Ball right now. It uh, looks like he's going to be discarding the Mind Jack Zoroark alongside another card here. So maybe trying to develop a Glycopod, perhaps or uh, get some other things going. I think he's also got a couple of puzzles in his hand, also as a Rua, so he has plenty of options this turn. Yeah, and of course, what he could do here with this Ultra Ball is he could grab himself another Tapu Lele, yeah, use that with, with the Wand Attack to grab yeah. the Guzma and do that very devastating play we just talked about. And, but, uh, but is he going to go for that, though? Yeah, is he going to go for that? I think, as we've said, that's what he's aiming to do mo in most situations, trying to deal with these evolving Pokemon while they are much more easily manageable. Just 80 hit points on these two Curliers, 60 on the Rolts, even with that resistance. That's going to be fine. So we are going to indeed see, as we've both mentioned, the Tapu Lele using the Wonder Tag, grabbing himself a Guzma. It's going to move this uh, heavy retreating Wimpod out of the active, also picking up a knockout on one of these Curliers, which is definitely a priority for him here. And again, a recurring story of the weekend. How was he able to find his way into those, into those cards? By using the trade on Zoroark GX mm -hmm. and drawing extra cards. Time and time again, we see that these cards with built-in draw engines just give you the ability to power through and just hit exactly what you need every single turn. And, and this is go. the true power of Zoroark GX. Yeah, second prize taken for Magnus. We know that Chris is definitely going to have the response here. We knew last turn he already had this combination of double colorless energy and Gallade. He's also going to be able to uh, get a Super Rod in to get back um, a lot of, uh, well, the Pokemon that was just knocked out, the uh, Curlier. And we're going to see also a Fairy Energy get back into the deck, followed up by a Curlier and an N as well to boot. It doesn't look like Magnus has any Pokemon currently on his board that can respond on this Gallade. So I think although 
Christopher is behind on prize cards. He's still in a really good spot. Yeah, I could not agree more. This Gallade is going to fall to this... Uh, this Dorak is going to fall to this Gallade now. Of course, that sensitive blade uh, attack is going to put a lot of hurt in uh, yeah. with uh, the fighting weakness and, of course, doing 70 more damage by virtue of Christopher having played a support this turn. And even if, Chris, if Magnus rather was able to find another bench Pokemon and a double colors to attack with the Zoroark, 120 will not be enough to KO the Gallade. That's 150 HP. Yeah, and Choice Band normally so important for helping Zoroark and Golisopod reach those higher numbers. Not going to work when there's Gallade. And uh, he's going to go for a premonition before announcing his attack. Uh, being able to look at the top five cards of your deck and simply rearrange them. Uh, this is also going to help him smooth out his... Uh, turn. It looks like he doesn't have any rare candy that he could maybe draw into for the next turn because he does have a Guard of Wild GX in his hand so I think he just put a Rolts to the top by the looks of things. And uh, there is going to be the Sensitive Blade for the knockout. It does a 60 base damage but if you do use a Supporter during your turn it does an additional 70 with weakness taking off Magnus's currently only main attacker and also it's the draw engine. It's so important to deal with these Zoroarks in this matchup. Yeah, absolutely and this is why Christopher plays to Gallade as well. He must have known that there was a very, bi very big likelihood that uh, Zoroark who would sort of make a big presence so we're seeing ahead into how mm -hmm. the Metagame would develop and thinking right at this point because Zoroark was so prominent it makes absolute sense to play two Gallade because then it gives me a very easy way of dealing with the Zoroarks and as we've heard from a few of the players who are piloting the Golisopod Zoroark variant you can see uh, Magnus, he's eyeing up the Mallow, which means he can put two of any cards he wants from his deck to the top, and then he can trade into those cards. One of the things he's eyeing up is going to be the Enhanced Hammer. Oftentimes, players have said, Gallade, yes, it's bad, it can take four prizes, but if I can combine 120 damage plus an Enhanced Hammer in the same turn, I can maybe get around Gallade over a two-hit KO situation and get away with it. Yeah, and this is exactly why Golisopod is so important to have as an alternative attacker. We see, it, we saw yesterday that Seb Simmons played the sort of more straight version of Zoroark, just more focusing entirely on that. That does have its own benefits as well, but if that variant of the deck just came against uh, you know, two, a two-Gallade ga Gardevoir deck, I think you would end up really having a hard time, whereas yeah. with this variant, you have that alternative option. So we are going to see uh, Magnus putting his favoured two cards at the top, and uh, he does have the trade to draw straight into those. The Enhanced Hammer, it looked like the Tapu Koko was the second card he was looking for. Instantly throws down the uh, Enhanced Hammer, and he's simply going to Energy Drive to put the 40 damage, putting that Gallade in range of a future knockout from either Golisopod or Zoroark. GX. Yeah, yeah, just uh, doing that softening up there just to make sure that uh, it doesn't fall foul of anything. There goes the Rolt Switch. Uh, Christopher puts to the top of his deck with the Premonition. Going to bench that straight away, but as you said, Joe, no rare candy for him means that other Rolts, which has already been out, won't be evolvable uh, this turn. <laughs> And uh, that could be a problem for him. In fact, that Gardevoir might be hitting the discard pile off an Ultra Ball. Yeah, so Chris, he has a Professor Sycamore in his hand, but he also has his second Super Rod. So that's why he's getting rid of these two Pokemon. He's going to go ahead, grab himself the Remoraid, simply Super Rod back in the Pokemon that he discarded, as we're seeing. And uh, he's just making sure that there are three valid targets in his discard pile. So also the Alolan Vulpix having to join the deck once again. And he's going to grab himself Remoraid, really trying to establish his board as much as possible before using his uh, supporter for the turn. He also has Premonition still available to him if he wishes to do it before the supporter to see if it's even worth going for this move. Um, or he can do it after the Professor Sycamore to dig even f or have the insight for even further into his deck. Yeah, and, and uh, so there is a Sycamore going to be discarded even more so. It looks to be like a Fairy Energy and uh, some other things which we couldn't quite get a good glimpse of. But off of that, drawing into... Ooh. Yeah, no double colorless energy, nor could he get the combination of a Gardevoir GX, a Secret Spring, and a Manual Fairy attachment. So just going to be a premonition here, and Christopher may be stuck with the Gallade active. And this is exactly why the Enhanced Hammer is being played by Magnus, and it's proving dividends here of how important it is. Yeah, just uh, Enhanced Hammer is one of these sort of tempo-stopping cards where it, it puts your opponent in a position where they think, right, if you don't have the means of... You, you know, undoing this sort of a step back I've taken you, then that will give me the opportunity to get back into the game, whereas otherwise you could have snowballed and absolutely steamrolled me. Now Magnus has the opportunity to capitalise on this by, hopefully for him, KOing this Gallade with a first impression, Ooh. and then, oh, maybe not. <laughs> still, still a really big pickup for Christopher. This is still the thing that keeps him uh, on track, being able to heal just that 40 damage so that he is now back out of range. So even though he couldn't get the knockout this turn, um, he's still eligible to keep this Gallade around as a big threat. So Magnus still has to work around the Gallade here. So pretty smart stuff from Christopher. He does play four copies of Max Potion after all. He's really fond of that card, playing it in the Metagross and now in a new Stage 2 deck, the Gardevoir build. Yeah, absolutely. There goes the uh, trade from Magnus. Able to find himself another Enhanced Hammer. Could use it to discard the uh, Double Colors on the Tapu Lele, but is that the best Ooh. use of it, I wonder? I mean, I, I guess if he's Sycamoring anyway. Yeah, he was going to Professor Sycamore and he has Puzzle of Time still available to yeah. him. So may as well cash in while he can. 
I imagine he'll just be going for another 40 damage this turn. Speaking of which, there's, he actually drew into the two puzzles of the time right there. There we go, yeah. <laughs> so I don't think he needs anything this turn. Maybe a grass energy attachment to one of these wind pods, just in case Christopher can once again max potion 40 damage. Then it gives him the option to GX attack to KO a Gallade if he does get an attachment this turn. But no, he has nothing else he wants to play this turn, so he's just going to go for that 40 damage again. And let's see if Christopher can go for a max potion play, or he does have the combination of Guzma and double colorless energy. This has got to be targeting the Zoroark, you would think, at this point. Oh yeah, danger zone. There goes the uh, goes the Curlio into the active. It does have a retreat cost of one. It will be able to retreat back into there that Gallade. Is. Yep, Gallade coming back out into the active position. He has the double colorless energy. It was put to the top via the premonition. Christopher has the combination that we were so worried about. Now he can evolve into his Gardevoir GX. Um, the only thing from him at this point is that he's taking another two prize cards, going down to two. He hasn't yet established his artillery. There are currently no energy cards on his Gardevoir. The only thing that can help him out at this point is Premonition to maybe manipulate his top decks. Uh, and especially considering this Zorak's going to go down, and he said, Joe, it is the main way this deck works. That mm -hmm. trade engine is what gives you the deck so much power, and uh, without it, uh, Magnus is just in a bad shape. Yeah, it's a double whammy, really, taking out the uh, main attacker at the same time as the ability. That's one of the uh, downsides of one card being so good and your whole strategy being focused around it is that once that's taken out for Golisopod, if he's able to search into it, we know he has those puzzles of time available to him. Uh, so he isn't necessarily out of this situation just yet. He could also think about getting things like double colorless energies back before using an N to guarantee a knockout with an energy drive, but that does involve putting a lot of energy onto the board. But wow, here we're seeing the Mewtwo tech coming into play here. Oh, very interesting indeed. This is something that's uh, it's a tech card that some lists have opted to use, maybe anticipating that Gallade might be make a big showing because, of course, it does do at least 20 damage plus 20 more for yep. each energy attached opponent's active, so it's a way of actually dealing with Gallade. Yeah, and that's going to be exactly what he's going to go for here, seeing as though it's a non-EX uh, GX Pokemon, a single prize attacker, uh, Christopher being at two prizes, this is a brilliant thing to throw into the active position, respond on this Gallade finally, and also leave Christopher with a very low hand size and a new hurdle to get over. Yeah, this is, this is perhaps... Well, perhaps achieving it via slightly different means, this is the kind of comeback yeah. that you mentioned he needed to do to get, back, get himself back into this game. Put down a threat that can actually deal the Gallade, combine it with an N, hope Christopher doesn't draw much of anything. This is exactly what Magnus needed to do in his turn. The Puzzle of Times helping him guarantee it with the double colorless energy that he was able to recover. Also put a Enhanced Hammer back into his deck for future turns by the looks of things. He's going to use the free retreat on the Tapu Koko and announce the, uh, I believe it's the Psychic Attack. Yeah, Psychic. In order to knock out this Gallade. Only one prize for Magnus even though it has um, taken four on its own. So that's pretty <laughs> efficient trading, I would say, for Gallade. Great job. Yeah, that's uh, one of the re reasons why Gallade is so great. It is able to trade very favorably with these. But did Ooh. Christopher just draw pass? Yeah, he drew and passed. I know there's a max potion in his hand, so maybe not too threatened by what Magnus can pull out here. I think the best thing Magnus can do this turn is perhaps uh, Lysander, or oh, sorry, Guzma, <laughs> the Remoraid Lysander. I'm living in a different format. Here we go. If he can deal with the Remoraid, it would really limit Christopher's long-term prospects in terms of how he can get himself back into this game and out of an awkward hand size so if he has that option available i'd love to see him go for it i no doubt if he had the option available to him that's probably what he'd go for uh, i mean we i did actually catch a glimpse of something green in his hand so i believe he does have the grass Ooh. energy if he has the guzma that could be strong there's the ultra ball he can't go for the tapu lele because uh, there's his bench is full so <laughs> he can't use that to grab the guzma sadly but he can use that to grab another glycopod and evolve the wind pod at least yeah that's going to be something for him at, at least it's thinning a couple of cards that he wouldn't otherwise like to draw into because he too is going down to a, a smaller amount of prize cards remaining. It doesn't look like he has the Guzma, but he does have an N. I imagine he won't be playing that, seeing as though Christopher did nothing in his turn. So potentially just the payment of retreat to start putting damage on this um, Gardevoir, or he could just be content with 20 damage. He knows that Christopher, here's the thing, at this point everyone knows each other's deck list. He knows that Christopher still has a large amount of max potions remaining. If he brings the Glycopod into the active and does 120, Christopher can simply max potion and then Glycopod is stuck. So as we can see here, it's keeping a conservative approach, going for the Psychic just for 20 damage. Yes, and uh, eventually... Oh, he's oh, thinking not. about it. Oh. <laughs> he still has the attachment available. I wouldn't... Yeah, I, I like the attachment, but just still not playing the end. That makes the most sense to me. And uh, we're going to see the Psychic uh, 420 here. There seems... Is there some kind of... Oh, he's uh, still debating he's really it. debating it, yeah. There it is. At long last. <laughs> <laughs> so Christopher has a little peek at that card. Does it change anything? He's having a look. It looks like it does change something, seeing as though it's a parallel city. A uh, little bit awkward. I think it forces uh, one of those Tapu Lele's definitely off the bench. That's the one that's obvious. And now he has to be put into a... Sp oh, wow. He's Ooh. taking away 
uh, the double colour synergy Tapu Lele. This could actually be helpful to him. It's obviously removing an attacker, attacking option for him, but it's also something that Christopher could have quite easily taken a knockout on, seeing as though it was always already providing Gardevoir with essentially 60 damage uh, because it had a double colour synergy on it. So pretty smart play from Magnus thinking, you know what, I don't need this Tapu Lele to win me the game and it could end up being a liability. Yeah, definitely. There is still uh, something with a similar number of HP in the form of the Glyspot of 40 damage on it, but there is the N. <laughs> and a big reaction from the crowd there. <laughs> There are start to, uh, there's going to start being a crowd outside. Now we are getting to these late on rounds. We are in the top eight. There's a lot on the line here. And uh, Magnus opting to play the end, giving Christopher a potential new hand here. He was starting to draw past, draw past, and just not do much. But uh, Magnus, he's getting himself three cards, and uh, he's tired of waiting at this point. Yeah, he is. And there goes the paid foot of the retreat, uh, bringing up the Goliath Spot. They're going to do first impression of 120. <laughs> <laughs> Double max pressure. And the Octillery. It's a huge draw. <laughs> it is a huge draw from Christopher. Octillery going to be able to use Abyssal Hand. And this is the exact thing that we were worried about on Christopher's side. Magnus not able to deny it. And you can see he's grimacing. He's saying, oh, man, that N helped you way more than it helped me. Combining it with a rare candy, Gardevoir into a Professor Sycamore. This is incredible. I think in the list of like regretful ends, this has got to be at least in the top ten, if not in the top five. Man, the, the crowd were cheering before they even saw Christopher's hand. They knew. They knew <laughs> that there was going to be uh, the chance for punishment coming in there. And uh, we are just seeing the judges double-check something here. Uh, but everything seems to be fine. I, it looks like Magnus only drew two cards from his own N. Uh, oh, is that right? I'm not sure what that was. It looked like he just saw an extra card there. But regardless, I mean, Christopher, he's so far back into this game now. He's been pole vaulted in terms of board, uh, board position. He's got energies now for his Gardevoir. He can do two secret springs. He has the Octillery in play now. He can also put down another Ralts, but he's also got the option to keep an eye on uh, his own GX attack. That's still available. He could start putting in things like Guzma to maybe help him close out this game if he needs to. Uh, so he has plenty of options still remaining. Yeah, he definitely does. Uh, he did have to discard one of his max potions off of that second war after having used one to kill, you know, heal off the guard of war after that first impression was done to it. Uh, it but for now, it looks like he's going to have to be content with a uh, infinite force for 90. And now he's going to go back to Magnus. Does he have a double colorless in his hand? Double colorless energy could really help out. Also, Acerola could be amazing at this point as well. These are the two things he has to look for. Only a low card hand size. It looks like he has an N and he also has a Professor Sycamore. But he, there's also a Guzma in here so he has a few options but nothing stands out as fantastic because the Glyspot is already uh, too heavily damaged ready to go back into battle if he does go for a Guzma play. Is it, does going for the artillery maybe still make sense here? Would that still set back Christopher enough? Because Magnus still has to take three prizes to win. Mm -hmm. So the, the artillery could be his third prize. And then at that point, you just focus down on one of the uh, remaining GXs to win. And it would cut off Christopher from drawing more and being able more likely to find a Guzma for the win, for example. It's only reasonable if he has another energy in hand, which I don't think he does, because that Glycepod is just too fragile with already 90 damage on it. But potentially it's the Guzma into his own Tapu Koko. Then he retreats into the damaged Glycepod just to pass because then uh, the artillery on board at this point so it's really an awkward turn for him you can see that's why he struck uh, Tapu Lele an ultra ball so that he can lower his hand size he can simply pay retreat and with the damage already on the Glycepod Christopher is going to be able to take the first game there yeah there it is so Christopher able to take game one and <laughs> I mean that end that was, good. That was just uh, that was the play of the game right there but ended up being the play of the game to help his opponent <laughs> yeah Magnus I think he was just tired of waiting around his hand himself was awkward and he wasn't happy enough with a top deck war he was thinking you know what maybe if I can get the upper hand with N I'm drawing more than Christopher because he was getting three to Christopher's two at the time he was thinking maybe I can be the one benefiting from this and getting out of an awkward spot but it turned out Christopher able to draw into not one but two max potions so he's able to heal the guard while they got hit heavily via the Galissapod GX and also he got himself the Octavia that was all important because he got him into a rare candy, a second Gardevoir, followed up by a Professor Sycamore, and he really gained control of the game from there. Yeah, absolutely. So, so strong. You know, you know um, one thing I would like to mention just uh, whilst uh, we're setting up here, we do, do see here, um, David Hockman is actually there as a <laughs> table judge. So uh, that should be a familiar face if you've seen some of the streams before. He's opted to, to judge at this tournament. And uh, to be honest, I think there's no one else I'd rather have at the judge table compared to him. Yeah, he is uh, keeping a hawk eye on things as always. If you're Magnus at this spot, what do you do to change the game? You obviously suffered 
awkward prize knockouts from the Gallade. Obviously, the end will be something he looks back at, and hopefully he doesn't beat himself up too much about it, because he still has two games here and plenty of minutes left on the clock to turn this around. I think the big issue was he wasn't able to find Grass Energy and Golisopod GXs. He has to focus on those. Yeah, that, that, that was the, absolutely the big thing. He wasn't able to attack with his alternative attacker. That's mm -hmm. going to be the main thing he uses in order to preserve his Zorox, to use mainly as a draw engine, and to power him through the course of the game. One thing he also wasn't able to do as well as perhaps he could have done, he started doing it a little bit where he started you know, taking some early KOs on Rolps and Curliers just to try and set up, but hmm. he didn't do enough of it. There came a point where Christopher was able to stabilize too much, and then at that point it was, it was you know, far too much for Magnus to be able to handle. Yeah, and credit to Christopher still, though. He was using the beacons very conservatively. He was going for extra Rolps whenever he could to make sure that he was never going to have his own setup stifled. So we're seeing the real power of beacon just because it can always be used going um, on your first turn. Um, you know, unless you're going very first, you, know, <laughs> you can use it the first option you can attack. And Christopher obviously doesn't play switch cards. He's gained spaces in his deck list by cutting Floatstone. Um, and that's so he can fit in some of these max potions and some other tech cards that he's playing. Um, but the uh, main difference between this list and other Gardevoir lists we've seen throughout the weekend and ones that have been popularized in previous regionals uh, is that he has cut the Sylveon line in favor of just one Alo and Vulpix. Yeah, indeed. And, uh, now, as you go see the prizes being laid out, there are actually two Zorak GX in the prizes yeah. for, um, for Magnus side. Not ideal there. It looks like to be a plethora of supporters otherwise. And now we've seen the, plays, the prizes being placed down for Christopher. Much less awkward. Not too terrible. one ofs of all sorts of different things. There is a Gardevoir. There is a double colour synergy. But I think he'll take that. And it looks like he actually leads with a low end Volpix as well. So really great stuff. Both players pretty much leading with their optimal starters here. Yeah, of course, the Wimpod with that Wimp Out ability. Able to retreat for no cost at all during the first turn of the game. So, and there goes the Tapu Lele for a, uh, I imagine what will be for a Bridget, assuming that he plays more than one. Yeah, Which he, he does, does he plays play, three. <laughs> yeah, he plays three. It's the, uh, the list that we've been seeing so much this weekend. And straight away, he started eyeing up basic Pokemon. He's finally grabbed himself a Bridget. Uh, he has got uh, a Tapu Koko that he's looking at. He's also going to have to quickly count things like the Enhanced Hammer. He's going to keep an eye out for the Mewtwo as well, of course. There's a lot of things he needs to tr keep track of if he is going to win this game. He has a second Wimpod in his hand, so that may be why we're seeing him eye up to Zerua, as well as the Tapu Koko here trying to fill his bench as quickly as possible and it looks like to bring something up but you can't switch into anything that you're able to retreat Tabu Koko just mitigates that entirely and especially with Golisopod it means that you always have something decent to switch into then switch back into the but all the same the Zoro is about parry through the game so it's not easy and it looks like he does actually just play the numbers game essentially yeah I, I kind of like this play I think he needs to try and bounce between Golisopod GX's uh, ideally, and start using Ace Roller to undo damage that Christopher does before it gets into a point where um, the Gardevoirs have too much energy on them, and especially when keeping two Wimpods around is definitely um, a high priority for him. We are going to see the Tapu Lele using Wonder Tag, grabbing the Bridget, and once again, he's going for three Rolts. He is trying to get as many of those into play as possible. I really like his approach. Oftentimes, you see players going for Remoraid super early, um, but he knows this matchup well enough that he says... My opponent is going to be going for early Guzmas. He only wins if he gets pressure on me. So if I can develop enough um, Rolts and evolve them up into my Glades and Gardevoir GXs, I'm going to be fine. So he's going to end his turn on a beacon here. Yeah, he's going to beacon. For that Remory we just mentioned, again, he's, he'd much rather have the, all the access to the Rolts that you're on rather than necessarily have access to the Octillery straight away because he knows it's more important. Also going to grab himself a Curlia because obviously there's no much point going for a fourth Rolts if you're going to go for the Remoraid. There is a Field Blur as well. Well, very, very vital for Magnus, able to get rid of that Parallel City and free up his bench again, following up with an N. Actually, that's a really, really strong counter turn from Magnus. Yeah, really nice turn. Magnus does play four copies of Field Blower, so I'm sure he was expecting a lot of Garb Oda and also expecting high Parallel City count in these Gardevoir variants. A lot of them opting to play a two count these days, so... Uh, pretty cool that he was able to get that straight away. He's also got himself into Zoroark GX. So after this fresh six cards, he's also going to be able to access uh, two more via trade. But as we say, again, he's not able to Guzma any of those Rolts. Um, so even if he is going to be taking an early prize with either Golisopod, if he's able to hit a Grass Energy, or using the Zoroark itself... Uh, it's still not a prize that he wants to be taking because it's only in a low-end Vulpix. No, indeed not. Also, it's funny how uh, we, I was talking before about, oh, he'd he rush rather discard a Zorox, he plays more of it, but the, he actually drew into the third, uh, third Wimpod before drawing into either one of his two <laughs> remaining Zoroas. 
So he does look oh, like actually, he's found, he drew both. Yeah, he's found himself as a Rua. He's found himself a Grass Energy. He can freely retreat and go for the first impression. Much better than bringing the Zorak GX into the active because we saw at any moment there can be a rare candy into Gallade and that could be really terrible for him. I actually think Christopher has those combinations in his hand. He's using one of those old Great Encounters rare candies, it looks like, that's sneaking around in there. And uh, he is going to promote the Rolts and uh, progress with his turn. Yeah, just a, generally speaking, a much, much stronger early, few early turns from Magnus. is able to lead with Golisopod. He's got the Zorak ready, you know, just so that in case he ends up needing to use it uh, for the tradability or if he ends up needing to do right as beating. But his uh, attacking lead is much more effective here. And Christopher's going to have a much harder time dealing that Golisopod than he has done with the Zoroks in Game 1. Yeah, definitely the case. So we are going to see... Um, Christopher sort of eyeing up the Professor Sycamore. It was a little bit painful. It's one double colorless energy going into the discard pile. He has prized one as well. Um, so even with this premonition, it looks like he was trying to find more evolution pieces. He plays a very high count of curliers. He plays three of them. He's drawn into one of them, so he can't be too dissatisfied with that. And he's also got these five cards to look at via the premonition from Gallade um, to maybe set up his board a little bit further for next turn. And uh, he's going to have to be content with evolving one curlier and also um, dealing with the sensitive blade for 130 damage after using that sycamore yeah absolutely he won't be attaching the choice band to the active because of course uh, 130 is already enough to do it twice to two shot the Goliath pods so better to save the choice band for a guard of wild to pick up a one shot later but in the meantime back to magnus's side he really wants to find an acerola here he wants to undo that damage stop christopher from getting the two shot it looks like he's going to go for the trade on the bridget uh mm. discarding it to draw two cards I draws into another bridget yeah it draws into another bridget but also a puzzle of time i think that completes uh the two copies required in order to do the secondary effect of a puzzle of time but i'm not sure if he has any acerolas currently in the discard pile or a means of accessing more. He could even go for th something like Puzzle of Time to get another Zoroark GX that I think he discarded earlier on in the turn to get more trades going, but I think he may be in an awkward spot here. He may not be able to deal much here. There's actually going to be a Guzma play. Again, as we've said this whole time, it's a tale of how much can he stifle the early setup. Uh, and uh, we do see there's a grass energy attachment onto the Glyspod, and he's going to be able to take out this Curlia with one energy attached to it as well. Yeah, this is really, really strong stuff for Magnus. Not only was he able to take out another one of the evolving bases on Christopher's side, he was able to do it with the fresh Glyspod. So although he may, might not have had the Acerola, he's still now forcing the Chris Christopher to have a Guzma in order to bring up that Glyspod to KO it. Very good stuff for Magnus. And uh, you can see Christopher, he knows exactly what his top deck is going to be. Um, I couldn't tell myself what the top five were. I think it's just going to be a guard of YGX that he's drawing into. So I don't think he has Guzma available. So he may just be promoting this um, delayed, knowing that he has to not play the Guzma. And Oh, okay. So he does have Guzma available. That's the reason why he would promote Tapu. Okay, so he put yeah. a Tapu Lele to the top. And uh, we are going to see the Wonder Tag, I'd imagine, at this point. Guzma is already at the top of his, or the bottom of his deck, yeah. that he can access straight away. And uh, he's just saying, give me that damaged Golisopod. He knows that that Zorak is going to remain um, always an easy two prizes, but the Golisopod can be denied from him. So yeah, it's yeah. more important to deal with the Golisopod now because that Zorak will be around for later. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Just uh, take the two shot while you can. There goes a Super Rod as well. Looks like he's just going to shuffle back in some of those uh, early pieces of Gardevoir lines that were KO'd early on. And uh, let's be a Fairy Energy 2. And uh, those are going to go back uh, nice and handily. There is also, as you already mentioned, it's uh, the rare candy peeking out of Christopher's uh, hand there. I'm not sure. I don't believe he has access to a guard no. in hand, does he? I think uh, he would have loved to have get more set up, but I think uh, he had to go for the Guzma play. I think keeping up tempo-wise, keeping the Gallade... Um, healthy as well is going to be important. I think for Magnus next turn, it may be the ideal moment to go for a GX attack on his Golisopod. We do see Christopher, he has options. He uh, has another Gallade that he can draw into. <laughs> the crowd have started applauding already <laughs> and Christopher's just sort of musing saying, do I actually want any of these five? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think the Gallade is still pretty good, Joe. Yeah, Gallade and a Rare Candy seems like a good combo to me. And there is going to be the Sensitive Blade uh, for the knockout there. Of course, Guzma being the supporter used that turn. And uh, two prizes taken for Christopher taking uh, the um, uh, evening up the prizes, I should yeah. say. And uh, the Zorak GX is going to be thrown into the active position. Interesting because he had the Tapu Koko as a free retreating option. So that's a really surprising uh, choice from him. Uh, but uh, let's see what else Magnus can get up to this Ooh, turn. A huge draw for Magnus. He's able to find himself the enhanced hammer. So now Oof. he will be able to use that to discard the, the double colors. And he will be able to do the strategy of, you know, putting in a, a, the start of a two shot onto the Gallade. Mm -hmm. And then with Christopher, if he isn't able to find a double colors, dealing with it that way. 
Oh, man. Oh, this is such a fantastic play. Magnus is being able to pay retreat on the double color synergy so that he can regain it with the puzzle of time. This is why I was questioning why there was no Tapu Koko in the active. It's because Magnus had a better plan. He said, I am going to guarantee the crossing cut GX this turn and combine it with an end. That was a really fantastic play from Magnus there. Re really showing that he is absolutely no slouch and mm -hmm. uh, that he's prepared to make these really really high level plays that probably a lot of people wouldn't even thought about because you, know, you think, yeah. oh, I don't want to get rid of the double colors <laughs> resource. Why do I want to do that? Oh, wait, I have puzzles I can use to put out on somewhere more effective and actually deal with the biggest threat on the board. And especially when you have trade available, do you think I'm not going to miss double colors energy. I can draw so many cards via my trades, but he's making sure that he can guarantee it. And that's what is most important because as we saw in game one, Gallade took too many prizes. That's why he lost. So he has to make sure that that is dealt with right now. Yeah, and that's uh, exactly what he's doing. Combining it with the end as well, just to make mm -hmm. sure that, because uh, he probably knows that Christopher is likely to be able to access a supporter or a means of getting another attacker into play. And so just by playing the end, he's able to shuffle away that uh, that. You know, those top five which Christopher rearranged, dealing with the Galad, using the crossing cut, knocking it out, and now what does Chris do? Chris has to promote a Tapu Lele, it looks like. He has a rare candy. Does he draw into a stage two? He laughs. <laughs> That's a huge draw from him. He's able to get a rare candy, a Gardevoir, also a fair energy that he can secret spring on. It looks like he also has a choice man and an end, so that was an amazing draw from him. That was an absolutely amazing draw, considering he's got <laughs> the end to boot, so he will be able to you shuffle uh, Magnus' hand away, make him any draw free. Not going to affect Magnus as much. He does have two Zoroks ready to go to mm -hmm. use trade abilities over and over, so uh, that will work out of him at least, but I don't think Christopher could have asked for a much better top deck than that. And what is amazing uh, from Christopher's side at this point is that he has so many max potions that he can afford to have these slower turns. He can say, you know what, I can promote this Tapu Lele. You're a deck that goes for two hit KOs. If I just leave this in the active and start building a Gardevoir, which I needed to do this turn, I can get away with that because I know that the damage that you'll be putting on my board, I can remove later on. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, now from the end on Christopher's side, he did. Yeah, he did actually draw into a uh, Gallade. Obviously, not going to be able to do anything with it now. You do see also an Ultra Ball, so yeah, going to discard that just straight away, making sure that Magnus doesn't make him fall victim to an end himself. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see what he goes for here because I'm not sure how many other evolutions uh, Christopher has access to. He looks like he's eyeing up a Rolts. Yeah, he has. The roles that he has to start developing. He did have to Ultra Ball away a Gallade, which is a little bit annoying because it's such a good attacker in the matchup, but I believe he still has one Super Rod remaining. So he's likely going to be trying to recycle that at some point in the game. He does, of course, still have the GX attack available to him as well. Um, one of the reasons why Gardevoir GX is so fantastic is that you can have great management of your resources. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And now, meanwhile, for back from Magnus' side, there's a bit of an interesting debate as to what he could do. Obviously, to first of all, discard a Field Blur you know, with the trade, drawing two extra cards, finding a Zora and what looks to be an Ultra Ball or a Double Colors. So not sure which one he drew off the extra one there. But uh, after that, looks like he's actually thinking think of playing the Ultra Ball or no, going to go for the trade. Yeah, once again, second trade. As we always say, it's best to see as many options as you can um, and then make the decision, the most informed decision you have available to you. So with this Ultra Ball, he could be eyeing up maybe another Tapu Lele if he has any remaining uh, to get a supporter going, maybe starting to pressurize the guard of one with a Guzma play. That could be something he goes for. But at the same time, it always feels more futile knowing Christopher's list where he has these max potions. Yeah, and that makes me think maybe what something Magnus could go for. He does have, he just discarded a double colorless uh, off the Ultra Ball, but he does have another one in his hand. Could it be an idea to fly and flip and then leave the two Tapu Leles within range for a uh, first impression 150 with a choice band? Yeah, it's really, really reasonable. I think he might have to do that at some point in this game, but this turn it looks like he may be eyeing up a Guzma to maybe deal with this Rolts. That would take him to two prize cards remaining and then he can go for that Tapu, uh, sorry, the flying flip line later on in the game. So I think it's great that you spotted that and it's definitely something we can go for. But again, all these nice neat numbers that you're trying to make work for you Christopher can max potion his way out of it again yeah he can max potion his way out of it but one of the reasons why actually doing it in that order especially makes a lot of sense is because he will be able to do that to two leleys so yeah. then Christopher will need two max potions to heal, heal yeah, off both the leleys and make that happen we're going to see the payment of retreat and uh, also he's going to opt to take the knockout with the Zoroark I really like this because it's a lot of energy to get rid of 
but it means that it's much safer on the bench for future turns because Gardevoir, of course, gets more powerful the more energy you have on yourself as well. Yeah, definitely. And also we know that he wants to preserve that Goliath spot in order to get his last KO on Attack with Lely after following up with a flying flip. So really important from that perspective as well. Now, it'll be interesting to see how many double colorless Magnus actually has left. Does he have another one to do this flying flip with to prepare the strategy? I'm not entirely sure if he does, come to think of it. Both players looking frantically at either's discard pile. It's interesting how much access both players have to their discards. Uh, Magnus, of course, running the four copies of Puzzle of Time. Christopher has the GX attack, which may well be his option this turn. And uh, both players, actually, it seems like he's content to simply go for the infinite force with the choice band. It's going to deal 120 damage. Let's see what Magnus can do. It's on turns like these where Acerola could be the best friend and can really put Magnus into a favorable spot. So both players trying to two hit KO one another but they also both have healing options. They this do. is a pretty interesting stalemate here. Acerella would actually be the perfect card because not only would he be able to, you know, heal off the Zorok, but then he'd have the double colors in hand to do the flying flip and set mm -hmm. himself up for that win condition. Unfortunately, it looks like he's got to be... Oh, no, he's going to do the trade. trade. Yeah, he's looking for these cards. He gets himself a double colors energy, so at the very least, he could retreat and get a flying flip off if he wishes to. Uh, he has another trade available to him if he wishes. Um, is the Enhanced Hammer... It's interesting, because the Enhanced Hammer always seems like a good card, but at this point, there's no rolls on the bench that threatens him that become Gallade later down the line. There's already two Gallades in the discard pile. Maybe that's the card that's weakest in his hand at this point. You can see Magnus uh, mulling over his options once again, taking a breath to see what's the weakest card. You've got to think if he trades away another Guzma, it can only come back to haunt him, seeing as though he does need that as an out to win the game if he does go for this setup on many Tapu Leles with a flying flip. Yeah, you can tell he's agonizing over this. He's going to look at uh, Christopher's discard pile quickly before he makes his decision just to make sure he isn't missing anything really obvious. And I think it looks like that sort of helps make his decision. Oh, he's looking at the Guzma. He still, of course, does have the... Okay, there's going to be the payment of retreat here before anything else. I think he's used both his trades. In comes the Tapu Koko. So, he, so he's identifying the same lines that we're thinking. There's going to be the Guzma as well. So it looks like he's actually going to move back out of the Tapu Koko and bring up the Zoroark. He's forcing himself into an awkward prize position here just to deny Christopher the option to use... Um, artillery, so it's an interesting shout from him. Christopher, you can see, rocking back in his chair, he's saying, oh, that was something I wasn't expecting. Yeah, so, I, I, I'm not sure. It, it is a line that works, obviously, it does uh, mean that Christopher doesn't have access to artillery, as you said, but it does leave him potentially a little bit vulnerable. I guess maybe Magnus is fearing using Zorak a little bit less, just because the, you know, he knows that Galadu isn't an immediate threat. Yeah. But at the same time, it does mean that you know, this whole line of you know, going for the two-shot to win the game, he's for essentially done Christopher's work for him in, for, in terms of forcing himself into a seven prize game because his last prize is going to be so hard to get now. Yeah, and he spent a lot of Guzmas in the process as well. The one thing it does do is that this Ultra Ball uh, from Christopher, it would have definitely have been an artillery, uh, but now that's been taken away from him. He thought it would have been safe, um, but instead he's going to have to keep an eye on what else he wants to put on the bench. He can't put down any more basic Pokemon, so maybe he's just going to thin a useless card from his deck. Uh, maybe it's going to be uh, a Curlia or something like that before a Professor Sycamore. We know he's just discarded a Guzma with this Ultra Ball. He has another one in his hand, but I imagine he wants to be dealing damage to this Zoroark all over again. And you can see he's going to Ultra Ball, find himself the Artillery with no intention of using it, uh, seeing as though it's just the Remoraid was just knocked out, but he can thin that from his deck while he goes for the Professor Sycamore here. Yeah, and uh, there it is. It looks like he's going to be discarding a Curly off the Sycamore as well, and uh, what looks to be, yeah, so that's two Guzmas gone without being used, which is a bit of sad news for him. There goes the Sycamore. He's got the seven cards ready in hand. He seems to be found another Curly. A couple of Fairy Energy might be good for him, and uh, a Choice Ban to boot. Uh, not great. He didn't find himself any double colors energy. I think uh, potentially he still has one secret spring available to him. He's also got another Ultra Ball where he can start thinning some cards if he wishes. He was looking at the Max Potion and seeing whether or not it's worth it for him. I think potentially this turn he's again going to be content with the two-hit KO because uh, he's now holding a new Max Potion in his hand. He could... Um, they could basically trade two hit KOs on each other, yeah. but Chris knows that he has a Max Potion currently in hand to wipe away some of that damage. And Magnus has an Ace Rollers yeah. pretty in his hand as well. So there goes the Infinite Force and Christopher going to be able to um, do 150 damage, but it is going to be undone by this uh, Ace Rollers of Magnus' side. They're going to do his trades first just to make sure he sees all the options he can, but after that I imagine there will be an Ace Roller into another attacker. Yeah, likely the Glycopod as well because I see a Grass Energy in there. There's going to be a Field Blower getting rid of the Choice Band. These numbers may end up mattering. And uh, also, Magnus doesn't want to draw into any of those himself either. So uh, if it's not going to be trade fodder, you can, of course, use the card. That can, that can also get cards <laughs> into the discard pile. Yep. And uh, we are going to see definitely the... Um 
The use of Ace Roller here. Would, I would love to see the Tapu Koko coming up at this point for the flying flip here. Yeah, there it is. There's going to be the double colour synergy. He's looking over. Um, if he goes for this line, instead he's going to attach the grass energy to the... Ooh, he's double thinking it. <laughs> it's, it's one of these things where... Um, the, the thing is about the Tapu Koko line is it depends entirely whether he's actually out of Guzma or not. He does yeah. have access to two puzzles at a time, so maybe he can use that as the out, but maybe instead he's thinking, you know what, I'd, I'd rather just try and try my luck with a two-shot. hope that Christopher doesn't have a max potion. But yeah, unfortunately, we <laughs> <laughs> one off the top. That's a great thing as well. It's almost mind game-like that he used the one that he drew into yeah. because... Um, he already had one in his hand, uh, so seeing the one that he drew into may lead Magnus to believe that there wasn't one previously in there. Yeah. So the fact that he's done it this way is actually really intelligent, even though it was just kind of cool at the same time. Yeah, yeah, it was. <laughs> and also, sadly, kind of undone by the, by the virtue of the fact that uh, Christopher just played an N. Yeah, that's also very true. But um, there is going to be one attachment. He still has potentially more, seeing as though he, secret, he used Secret Spring to put this uh, fair energy on in the first place. So he could be dealing even more damage. But also, we have to think about resources. We keep saying that the GX marker is yet to be flipped from Christopher, and potentially 90 damage is enough on this Golisopod, but um, also at the same time, he could be looking to go for a GX attack here. He did draw into double colour synergy here. There's going to be an Ultra Ball as well, getting rid of more things that he doesn't want to see in his deck. You can see lots of fair energy, lots of max potions, uh, not much junk left in there, to be honest. He's going to grab himself a Rolts, obviously not going to be benching it, seeing as though Bandus is down to one prize card remaining, uh, but he just wants to thin that from his deck so he doesn't draw into it. Yep. And uh, he's going to keep an eye on what he can do here. Just the 90 damage is going to be enough with the infinite force. And that's one thing that's always underappreciated with Gardevoir. This is a one energy attack. And he just did a two hit knockout on a Glycopod pretty much because you know that that can stack once again on the next turn. Yeah, definitely. Not only that, but then if Magnus were to hit Christopher back with his own attack, then Ma Christopher loses a lot less by max pushing off one energy than you know, two or three or four. So that's, uh, it was a really... It's, uh, the way the infinite force works in that sense uh, really works out in his favour and now Magnus is going to go for a, a trade number one finds himself an N and a Zoroark then that's uh, able to find you know, able to evolve that way and he will be able to go for trade number two now and he finds himself Ooh, an Ace Roller that's a really big pick up from him going to be able to undo some more damage but it looks like on his board the only energy he has is a grass so even if he does wipe off some of this damage um, he'll just have to maybe promote something like Tapu Koko let that take a hit um, and try and set up this Glycopod over a couple of turns. Yeah, and that's unfortunately what he's going to have to do. So down goes the Wimpod. I think there's even an, maybe an argument to not attach the, the grass, just like leave it there. Just There to... is an argument to it for sure, but does Christopher ever go for a Guzma play at this point? Because it would just, again, skew his own prize trade. So I really like the attachment. Yeah. It also opens up the play for the flying flip into... Um, the first impression as well to still give him the win condition that that's the most obvious one at this point yeah uh, because christopher has started to burn a few of his max potions uh, and this gardevoir is still looking very intimidating unless magnus is able to go for a more traditional two hit ko on it yeah absolutely so now from christopher what do you do if you're christopher it's definitely a um a GX attack turn as you can see he's rifling he's through his it, discard yeah. pile he's saying yeah I don't think 30 damage on a Tapu Koko is quite good mm. enough for me I'd much prefer to get some of these max potions back looking to find himself Guzmas as well as more energy so straight away he knew he drew his card and he was like yeah I'm not going to be hitting this Tapu Koko let's get back all the cards that make me move this card <laughs> instead yeah so there it is a free Guzmas two Sycamores two double colorless energies and what looks to be a max potion what else is he going to put in? He's got a few more cards. Away. Another Max Potion. And so it's that's at nine of the ten cards. Three Guzmas. Two Professor Sycamore. Two Double Colorless Energy. Two Max Potions as well. Maybe just a Fair Energy on top of that. He's already got a large amount in his deck. Uh, but it never hurts to put them back. Looks like Super Odd. That's potentially three Fair Energy. Yeah. <laughs> so pretty much going for the maximum amount of uh, recovery and switch out cards possible. Give him out after out after out. Oh, there is a puzzle of time drawn from Magnus' side. That could potentially be fun if he's able to find his second one uh, but can he do that so we know he can get a first impression off he has that option already available to him uh, he knows what's just been put back into Christopher's deck so he has a high amount of odds to draw into some of these supporter cards that could change the game for him um, of course Christopher still has four prize cards remaining and um, that still means he needs to deal with a couple of GX Pokemon all at once but Magnus is going to furiously look for his discard pile. What can he do to change the game here? He has a few trades to see some more answers. There's going to be a Glycopod put into play straight away. And we're going to see the first trade, it looks like, before any other action. And uh, yeah. I still think the best line has to be trying to go for a flying flip. Hope that there's not two um, Max Potions in the same turn. And then go for a Choice Banded 
um, first impression to finish off the Tapu Lele. Yeah. That's the most obvious yeah. play that we still see here. Yeah, yeah, that's what we've been going on about throughout the entirety of the second game. But in the meantime, it looks like Magnus is really agonizing over discarding his enhanced hammer. It looks like he really just doesn't want to do it. Yeah, he's seen two just be put back into the deck from Christopher, and he knows that if a Gardevoir does get out of control, there's literally nothing he can do. It could simply sweep the prizes. He's also going to check his own deck size to see can I do the trades before a Professor Sycamore maybe if I dig too hard into my deck um, I may not even be able to play Sycamore so we are going to see that's actually the card that he's going to get rid of it no it's yeah. going to be the card that he plays and uh, trying to hide the puzzle of time but Christopher instantly says oh what's that card oh it's a puzzle of time uh, and it looks like he's down to three cards remaining in his deck so uh, even though he has trade available he may not be able to use it anymore unless he knows he can take his final prize to secure the game here he does get himself a field blower, which he can also thin, and it does reduce God of our GX's output by 30. And um, that is going to be useful. We can see the double colorless energy that he has drawn into. Is this the turn that he goes for the flying flip? Does he have any choice bands remaining I as well? Well, this is the thing. This is why we were thinking he needed to preserve that puzzle of time, because now if he's unable to double puzzle, then he's out of yeah. either choice band or Guzma. This line of play no longer works. And... I don't, I don't know if maybe he just isn't seeing that line or actually, in fact, he's just resigned to not being able to do that. But the fact that he's doing first impression makes me think yeah. that he's actually just resigned from doing that play entirely. He's hoping to dodge and weave the max potion. Can he do it? Christopher looks at his top deck. Can he get around this in any way? He's going to have to look at the discard pile, but Magnus is currently searching for it furiously as well. Counting his Guzmas, counting his... Um, Christopher drew his own Guzma. Oh my goodness, he's that got his Guzma. That was his draw for turn, so not quite a max potion, but he could maybe use this to just buy himself, uh, buy himself a turn. And he's going to debate intensely of what to bring up. Maybe the Zoroark. So it's going to be the damaged Zoroark at this point. He must be content with the fact that uh, maybe he's going to look to deck out Magnus at this point. I think this may be his line. With plenty of max potions on his side, that could be the way for him to win here. We're going to see just an energy drive for 40 damage. And uh, let's see... Magnus, two prize card. Uh, sorry, two cards in deck remaining. Just one prize card. We know he has a double colorless energy in his hand, um, but Christopher may be looking for the longer term here, making it as awkward as possible for Magnus to finish out this game. We know he has more Guzmas in there because Christopher has just recycled two more. So potentially stalling for the game could be his win condition yeah. here. But does Magnus have the Guzma? This is the key question. If he's able to find himself the Guzma, then you know he is good to go. He can just uh, win the game from there. But it looks like instead he's just going to go for the enhanced hammer. And actually, if he had a Guzma, he would have just drawn it off of the trade straight away. So mm -hmm. that to me tells me that he just yeah. doesn't have it. I think he's out. We're going to see once again, trying to confirm it. But both these players looking for the discard pods so quickly. I saw three. Yeah, there's definitely four Guzmas and there's three puzzles of time in the discard. So it's definitely not an option. So just the Acer Roller, not even benching the Zerua because I don't think it even needs yeah. trade anymore. And, and just another huge top deck. What is it? It's wow, a Guzma. It's a Guzma. That's going to get a Zorak. He still has double colorless energy in his hand. So I think, again, Christopher trying to use his resources oh, to the best of his ability and passing again. Can Magnus get out of this? He has the double colorless energy still to retreat. This may be the last time he can use first impression. And then the Glycepod's just down to doing 30 per turn. And that's when the Max Potions could take over and Christopher could end up just squeezing out this game here. This is going to be it, folks. <laughs> this is down to the absolute wire. Either, either we're going to go to game three or Christopher's going to take this match and it's all going to come down to this next top deck from Christopher. Does he draw an out or not? This is really cute play from Christopher here. Magnus saying, you know what, the psychic for just 20 isn't going to be enough if I attach a double colorless energy um, to the Mewtwo. Paying retreat, I can do 120 this turn, but even then, then the Glycopod does so much less damage if I can't move him out of the active, which I don't think I can do again. I think Christopher's got it here. Yeah, of course, because even if he does the, the yeah, like you just said, he would need the double colorless to do the armor press uh, wow. next turn to actually do it. So with that Guzma, he actually might not even matter. <laughs> Christopher top decking Guzma into Guzma, finding his out to win this game. Magnus again going through all his options. His hand is large. He doesn't have any ends remaining. There's going to be the payment of retreat. Galicipod comes into the active. First impression for 120 damage. And I think there's going to be a top deck here. What is it? It's going to be a fair NG. He can retreat this Tapu Lele going into the Gardevoir. So now the Choice Band is no longer an out for a one-hit KO with Golisopod. 
I think that's what he's going to do. We're going to see an Ultra Ball. Okay, so he's getting rid of Rolts and the Fairy Energy. Um, he does not have anything that he can use here. He's just going to have a quick look through. And he's just hoping that his calculations are correct and yeah. that the Glycopod can only do 30 next turn. This is going to be the most ridiculous last card in deck of the entire tournament, more than likely. Man. What is it? When we said this was the final before the final, this has been an incredible <laughs> game. Before we see this top deck, let's see. What is it? He what looks, is it? I think it's his final puzzle of time. That doesn't do him any good. It's, it's over. It. Christopher wins in the top eight. What an absolute nail biter. <laughs> a thrilling top eight game there. Christopher Schumanti showing his prowess with the deck in such a resource focused matchup. And uh, wow. Oh, <laughs> I need a breather, Nick. I, I need one too. My goodness. I didn't think we'd see. I, I mean, considering all the amazing games we saw yesterday, I think Christopher might need a breather too. You can see there, he knew that he was riding the edge the entire game, but just able to squeeze it out right at the end for an unbelievable end to an already unbelievable match. Such high level play from both players. Magnus, you can see he was grimacing with the Professor Sycamore. He was saying, do I have enough fuel to get me through this game? Having to discard the third puzzle of time was so grim for him. Nonetheless, his final puzzle of time was actually on the bottom of his deck. Yeah. So those trades could have actually hurt him even more. So hindsight is going to be harsh for him. Looking back at that game, it may be something that he looks towards. But take nothing away from Christopher. Seeing that line so early on in the game, when there was still, you know, maybe 10 cards remaining in the deck. And uh, seeing that he could just simply retreat, retreat, retreat around his Pokemon. Goosmering up at every opportunity. Dealing with these two retreat cost Pokemon. Forcing... Uh, the double colorless energies to be thrown into the discard pile without getting any damage in incredible stuff and this is the level this is the high level play that you really expect from the people who've been playing the game for a long long time both the Shemansky brothers Christopher is obviously the one who's made top 8 here they've been playing for a long enough time to see these lines way far ahead than perhaps someone who hasn't got as much experience at these high levels of tournament play and absolutely paying off there with paying off the dividends with a top 8 win going to be advancing into the top 4 tomorrow I can't wait to see what happens in this game tomorrow if there were anything like that <laughs> yeah that was absolutely Absolutely astonishing. Christopher, so, so deserving of making it to the top four here. Doing it in style, showing off the prowess of not only the deck, but himself as a player. I mean, we didn't need any more evidence that he was an incredible one, but really, that was such a memorable game yeah. for everyone there. Yeah, and once again, an American knocks out a Norwegian. <laughs> yeah, the US 2-0 so far <laughs> in the top eight over the European players. So that's some bragging rights to be had as well. Yeah, there is absolutely. So I don't know about you, Joe, but it's, uh, it looks something suspiciously looking like uh, what maybe a Ross Gilbert in the background ready to talk to a certain winner of that, of that match. I think they're just getting ready for a little bit, but we'll be cutting them just soon. I can't wait to hear what Chris has to say on this. Yeah, I can't wait to see what he has to say, but, you know, we need a breather. We need to have a little decompress. So, Ross, give us a minute to have a breath. Yes. Thank you very much, Casters. Nick, you were correct. It does look like Ross Gilbert, but far more importantly, it looks like Christopher Schmensky, who just won a ridiculous game of Pokemon cards. Just talk us through those last couple of turns. That was incredibly tense. Yeah, uh, I, I, we don't have the time remaining up there, so I was thinking maybe I should concede and go to Game 3, not sure what time we have, but there was a still a decent chance of uh, winning, so I uh, went with that. The Twilight to get stuff back. Got admittedly quite lucky with the two Guzman in a row. Um, I know he had one DC. Uh, critical juncture for sure was when he, on the Sycamore, on his third to last turn, I believe, he topped that puzzle of time, uh, which meant he was not going to be able to Guzman the rest of the game, which opened up what, my deck out strategy, which is what I just did. Uh, yeah, there was a lot of variables, and they happened to go right. And they did indeed. That is one way to put it. And that was a very unusual win for Gardevoir. Usually with Gardevoir, it's either single energy attacks and max potioning, or it is just piling on energy and smashing. But... Just combining Max Potion, Guzma, etc. At what point in the game did you decide, I'm not actually going to win this by attacking, I've just got to try and waste resources? Uh, very late for sure. The, the primary strategy was definitely just to get to Sycamore or something off the Twilight, hope to get back into being able to take prizes eventually. Uh, only really occurred to me he could deck when he had two or three cards left in deck. So, uh, yeah. That's absolutely. <laughs> and the one question I've got to ask, we're seeing